How many of y'all out there are having a problem with a shoulder, a knee, a back, or your elbow? Is that slowing down your elk hunting preparation? Is it because of your elk hunting preparation? It could be from years of use and even misuse, or it could be a lack of simple strengthening or proper training. Whatever the cause, it can absolutely limit your effectiveness in the elk woods this fall. And limited effectiveness will mean limited success. We can't have that, y'all. Not in this elk camp. On today's show, we learn how to reduce pain, prevent injuries, train correctly, and perform at your highest level in the elk woods. That discussion, our Elk Bros shout outs and great questions from our awesome Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Cunning. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Cunning, brought to you by ElkBros.com with your host, Gilbert Ornelas and Elk Cunning coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Katy, Texas. That's right. We've got the leader of the Venezuelan mafia in the house, Mr. <laughs> Luis Gonzalez. I like it, and Picasso. From West New Mexico. We have the legend himself in the house, Mr. R.C. Knox. And from Cimarron, we've got your elk hunting coaches in the house, the ninja Leroy Chavez and WWJGD. What would Joe <laughs> Gilly in the house? And pulling up a chair to join the crew at Elk Camp today, we brought in a big gun all the way from Salt Lake City, y'all. Today's guest specializes in physical therapy and injury prevention for all outdoors men and women, hunters, bow hunters, archers, and mountain athletes. Basically, he's found a way to combine his two passions of physical therapy and the outdoors to help folks just like you and me get healthy, stay healthy, and stay in the hills chasing critters. Y'all, let's give a big Elk Bros welcome today to Dr. <laughs> Preston Ward. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd goes Wilson, crazy. Wilson, Wilson. <laughs> wow, what an, what an introduction. Thank you, man. <laughs> Most I'm welcome. Well. <laughs> Glad welcome. to have you, Dr. Preston. Welcome to Elk Camp, buddy. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you You're very welcome. Much. I just got to tell you, Mr. Ward, you know, you know, I hope you feel the same way I feel every time I join this podcast. I'm just surrounded by complete wisdom. You know, and, and, yeah. There is no doubt about that. I mean, we, we I, humble I, all, every day we show up. That's for sure. Luis, I don't know what I got myself into. I'm, this is intense right here. I'm oh, excited. you haven't seen no, the half of it. Yeah. For sure. You thought med school was tough, dog. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Navigating oh, this man. is an education, son. Let Don't worry about you. it, man. We take it easy on the new guy. Yeah. Thank you. First, yeah. It's Not. the manos of the world who have, really have a tough time around us. Exactly. <laughs> Dr. Ward, could you give us a little background on yourself? Yes. Thank you for, yeah. Thanks again for the introduction. Thanks for letting me have on. So Absolutely. I, yes, I am, um, yeah, Dr. Ward Preston here and from Salt Lake city, Utah, Sandy, Utah. And so live in the Wasatch mountains, basically. Um, and a little bit of background about myself. I grew up here in Utah, started hunting from an early age, um, ended up going to physical therapy school, receiving my doctorate degree there. Um, went on to a residency afterwards and studied orthopedics. So uh, my specialty is orthopedics everywhere from the head to the toes. And let's see, I was sitting in an archery shop after having not hunted for a few years because I was poor and a graduate student. So I had a little bit of money after grad school and sitting in an archery shop with a new bow and listening to old timers ask, you know, not even old timers, just people complaining of their shoulder pain. So I said, Hey, 
why doesn't someone capitalize on this and start a business? And then it dawned on me, that's gotta be me. And so, um, started doing some, started doing some market research and found out that, um, there was yet to be a physical therapist specifically for archers and hunters. And so started my practice about three, four years ago. And here we are today, enjoying every minute of it. Wow. That's too cool. He is yeah. the doc cool. of the elk bros, man. This dude. Doc, is... <laughs> doc of the elk bros. Doc of the uh, elk bros right here, man. Dr. So, yeah. Ward, we my, need it my too. Daughter, We're all my screwed up, man. Yeah. So my <laughs> daughter's currently looking at going into occupational therapy. Uh, she's at Washtenaw Baptist right now. I have two degrees when she graduates. She'll have one in kinesiology with pre-professional studies and then a degree in psychology as well. So they're two separate degrees in the same four years, but she's going to go to OT school. And uh, she's like, I don't know whether I should get my doctorate or, or what. So I'm like, I don't know, baby, but the well's getting dry. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. She, she's been, yeah. shat- she's been, she's been home from, she's been home from college and she's been shadowing, doing shadowing hours. And she absolutely loves working with people and, and, you know, seeing their injuries and helping them get better and stuff like that. So she's digging what she's doing. So um, I just, uh, you know, a guy from your background and stuff like that, I'll let her know that, uh, we talked tonight and then she'll listen to the podcast as well, but, but, uh, that's her, her passion is kind of going in that direction is helping athletes and, and hunters and, you know, anybody that is having trouble with either occupational physical therapy, that's kind of her, her deal. Well, as well, we're so. going to have a lot of questions tonight. Oh, Mr. dude, because Ward, like I said, yeah, we're all either aching, hurting, limping, cramping, <laughs> Eat up, man. You I mean, man. I mean, this group, I, I mean, we're just by, like, by, you put all of yeah. us together and you maybe get one good dude. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just tore my bicep off the bone I mean, eight weeks post op. But know. Luis, he doesn't yeah. do he, he doesn't do brain work, bro. You just you have to oh, like that's all right. we got to I was yeah, you, know, you gotta you we got gotta, the ninja over there. Oh, we don't yeah, have to yeah. worry about that. We, we got the brain. Yeah, I ain't right. worried about the brain part, man. It's just I, oh the rest of my buddy which doesn't work. How old are you doing? <laughs> No, I am 34. I should, I should elaborate oh, probably the, I I'm 34. So just turned 34 and, um, I should Ooh, elaborate. I've got a, I'm my, I'm married. Um, and it's been married, awesome. I think 12 to 13 years now have a little 12 to 13 times. Turned... 13. <laughs> oh, 13 I, years. You know, them, you know them Mormons up there, Joe? Them Mormons up there in I, Salt Lake, they like all them women, man. I, uh, I knew that. I knew that was coming. Yep. <laughs> I could. I knew I was going to have to figure out how to get it in, Doc. I'm going to have to figure out how to get it in. Joe edited it out, I promise you. Oh, no, not that one, man. That one's staying for sure. <laughs> Keep it in. It, it's good. It's good. A good conversation piece, but married and have a little girl. She's eight years old. And so, yeah, getting them into hunting and archery is fun. So got a, got a good life. I can't, I can't complain. People. Well, yeah, it's got a, a beautiful life, place so. where you live. I've been to Salt Lake city many yep. times and it's beautiful, beautiful country there, man. Yeah. Try, try to fix it now. Do what? <laughs> try to fix it now. <laughs> He's trying to fix it now. Well, yeah. me, so, good food. Too. So for, for, for our listeners out there, the, the, a little background on this is that um, I had an injury, and I really, I mean, we were on a pig hunt in February, y'all, right? Yeah. And, yes. You know, oh, I, I injured myself about hunt. four years ago, and in that amount of time, I've done things like, um, just really worked on keeping muscles strong and actually adapting and changing my shooting form to be able to shoot. You know, um, if you, and I never realized it till I look at images like years ago of me. And then I pulled up some of the shots of me drawing in the last two years on hunts and stuff and different things. And actually a listener made a comment on Instagram and when he did that on Instagram, uh, it, it kind of made me really like reevaluate and take a look. And I was like, well, I'm drawing the bow and I'm getting back and I'm killing things. And that was like my mentality. Well, we went on that doggone um, pig hunt. Yeah. And then when I started to get, when I got there and I tried to draw the bow in the blind, 
I, I about ripped everything, man. It hurt like a son of a gun because I could not then change in that tight situation, right? I couldn't draw straight back and I couldn't do what I did to adapt, basically coming up and using a bicep pull, you know, to be able to draw back and then rotating into my shoulder. That, that blind is probably like six foot by six foot in every direction. And he pretty much touched every single wall and cut every <laughs> single wall of that blind with that rod hole, head and in order to be able to top. draw that bow. <laughs> Poked a hole in the top of it. I looked at him, man. So long story short, what in the world, bro? Once I, once I get home, I'm sorry, Joe. You got a handful right here. <laughs> so once I get home, dude, I am. Well, hurt. you gotta understand, man. He's like the Messiah, and when we look over there, and he's like. <laughs> struggling bro i'm like man what is going on something must be wrong with his bow you know and, and it was the it was just the indian it wasn't the boat you know what I mean? yeah, yeah. and so you know? when i get home after that i mean i couldn't sleep at night i'm hurting all day every day i figure i'm you know i couldn't draw my bow back everything was like so i was like man i'm gonna I have a feeling it's up, it's time, I'm going to probably need shoulder surgery. So, you know, I go to my doctor, get get it scheduled, um, go get an MRI. And after I get my MRI, I call to be able to go see an orthopedic specialist, orthopedic surgeon. And they schedule me out to like, well, it's still, it's like July something, right? And this is back, <laughs> you know, this is back a, a month, a month or so. ago. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I'm giving my woes to Guy Duplanche. We're, you know, we're, I'm crying on his shoulder. And Guy said, Joe, Joe, look, dude, you ought to give a buddy of mine a call, man. Joe, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Joe. There you go. There you go. <laughs> he says, you're going you're gonna to meet Joe. him at Mountain Archery Fest. Yeah. He says, you know, he, he works yeah. with uh, Mobility Impaired out there. He does the course on there. He's, uh, he's an incredible PT, and he'll, he'll just Zoom with you and work with you like that and i'm like really and he goes here i'll, I'll hook you up and he makes a call and i make a call next thing i know preston calls me at like it was like in the evening and first of all i'm like whoa wait a second you know i i just had a doctor call me like after hours and you know he's not on the golf course <laughs> not on the i golf actually talked to him yeah. i actually talked to him yeah. Talk to him, and he's yeah. like, "Here, let's do this. Let's do this. Give me a call. Um, I'll, this tonight, later on tonight, I'll jump on with you, and we'll do an evaluation over Zoom." And I'm like, "Really?" <laughs> and uh, sure enough, you know, he hooks up with me, and uh, and has me stand here just like we are right now, coming back here, and he starts doing tests on me, right? And by the time I get done, he goes, "You don't need surgery, bro." I don't, I don't know oh. if he threw the bro in so quick yet, though. But I definitely threw the I definitely threw the bro in there. <laughs> so, and those really? things he was asking you to do, did he ask you to draw your bow? No, no, absolutely not. Oh, no. good, because no. is, if you were indoors, that would have been a bad deal. Yeah, yeah, it, <laughs> it wasn't going to happen, man. Uh, I could not draw my bow at the time, so he had me do different, different flexibility tests. And here's the thing. He told me, he goes, Joe, he says, this is what I think it is. Um, you, I believe you can get strengthened up and we can have you back to 100%. He says, I believe you. And he started describing which muscle it was, that it was micro tears, blah, 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 all of this stuff. And I get the MRI the next day after he does this evaluation and I send it to him. He had nailed it. I mean, mm. nailed it. first time, bro. Mm. Yeah, awesome. and, what, I mean, and the only time. problem is, what the heck, Preston, man? You make me pay for a test? Wait, wait. Just, yeah. no. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you charge no. him double, Preston. I'm telling you straight up, man. Exactly. No. Your buddies, yeah. you got to charge double because it's all that, you know, all that fluff involved in it, man. <laughs> exactly. No, that was one of the – I'll just interject here a little bit. Was, sorry, Joe, but that was – for me, I was like – when as soon as you Definitely. sent me that text message, I just said – Yes, I was just like, yes, I nailed it. Cause I mean, yeah, I, I thought that I did. And when I got that MRI and so, yes, absolutely. I a hundred percent recommend we hold off on MRIs and things like that because A, they are expensive and B from a clinical side of things, we can get so much more information 
than an MRI. And MRIs come back with so much other fluff in there, right? But anyways, mm -hmm. it was awesome. So oh, sorry, no, no, dude, no, 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 no. The, the rest of these guys here, no, he's telling y'all got to get MRIs. Y'all got to get <laughs> <laughs> I've done paid for mine, so you got you to get an MRIs, man. <laughs> I had one, Joe. That son of a gun was hiring giraffe tails, man. Yeah. Tell me about it, man. Oh. Yeah, I haven't yeah. got the bill yet. I haven't got the bill yet, man. Uh, no. Giraffe tail. So, so then Preston and I were talking, and really modified. You know, there's there's so many things RC deals with, Tab deals with. All of us have something that we're generally either because of a lack of training or training too hard or um, something that happens from, I mean, just an accident or something we do in our regular work day or, you know, we try to hang out of blinds by one arm and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> uh, you know it's it. But there's, gorillas. Gorillas. Yeah, there, there's things that happen and you feel it in your feet, you feel it in your back, ankles, neck. I mean, all kinds of places. And there's so many people out there and we get a and, and let me tell you something, y'all. This is not an old people thing. I'm telling you, I agree. Man, I agree. this is, you know, especially the people that have a tendency to hurt themselves more are younger people because they think they can just mm -hmm. jump out and do something sometimes. Well, and athletes it, too. And, and it, yeah, and it could be something that costs you your season, man. I mean, I have so many people, uh, Casey, if you're out there listening, I mean, I got so many people that, uh, that you know, have done something to injure themselves and had to have surgery, trying to rehab, or they, they have other things that they might not need surgery for. So, you know, I talked to you, I talked to you, Preston, and I was like, you know, this would be a perfect thing to get on the show and to talk <laughs> about how people, some of the things that they can do, preventive, strengthening, different little things for different areas to keep themselves hunting. Right? Yeah. So, and here's the yeah, cool Yeah, I mean, part. I... I I messed around, thought I I messed my whole season up. I I was really lucky and got a surgeon that would do it quickly, and uh, I think we're going to be okay. Um, way ahead of the game, he thinks we're in really good shape. But I'm telling you, one little false step, no no pun intended, and here I am, you know, with a distal bicep tear, and we're you know six months back to getting to where you're supposed to be, and really five months until he wants me even thinking about pulling a bow back. And uh, I'm like, man, dude, I really feel like I could do it now, <laughs> you know, mm. but he well, like, the, you slow your roll, partner. You the, know? Cool, the cool part about Preston is he specializes in hunters, outdoor, yeah. archer. No doubt. That, that's, wow. his, that's, that's his yeah. special. I mean, and, and you would think that's, that's a small population of niche, but it is, it's huge. And, and look, you know, me last year, Right. I mean, I, I started training hard and hard and hard and harder towards as I got closer to the hunt. And then right about a month before the hunt, I started to feel something like a, an electric shock right around my left ankle, uh, not ankle, the, the heel, right around the heel. And, uh, and I was like, oh, man, this is not good because I was running almost every day. And, uh, I had to, I had to rest it and I didn't want to rest it before the hunt, but at the same time, I was kind of in a bind because it's like, well, if I don't rest it, then I'll be hurting dur during the whole hunt. But if I, if I rest all this time, then I'm going to be out of shape, but you know, which one is it? So how do you find that, that, that good balance between, okay, you're recovering, but you're kind of maintaining your shape depending on where you get hurt. So, I mean, you can imagine the, the amount of questions that the uh, different all, you know, modifications of that kind of questions that, that we as hunters have, and you probably deal with every day. Sure. Yeah. That's what I, <clears throat> sorry to that, but I think that's, what's so awesome. And where I found this, this niche is that, I mean, for, for all of us in here, probably hunting, has always been a big part of our lives i'm sure for me oh but God. the last i think especially when you pick up that bow and arrow like hunting now become it's a lifestyle i mean if it if, is i know i know every single one of us in here are shooting our bows daily if not uh you know five times a week if not daily we're getting arrows in we're getting reps in we're putting miles in we're training we're running we're putting backpacks on we're 
you know, I think it, I mean, here in Utah, we are down less than 12 weeks until hunting season. And so, I mean, it's, it's really go time. And so if you start thinking about like injury and training, ramping things up, I mean, it just fits to really go, I guess, be wise about that. I always say this and I'll, I'll probably say it again in this, but I think the best investment you can make in any of this, I mean, we buy expensive bows, arrows, gear, backpacks, camo, whatever it is. Um, but the most important investment is the investment you make in yourself, really. And so yeah. a small investment that um, my good friend Joe here, he, he made a small investment, right? And the outcomes are speaking for themselves, like, you know, doing great, shooting, shooting better, strong, all sorts of things. And I think that's, that's the key thing here is make that investment find, you know, that expert. And that's kind of where I feel very humbled that I've been able to, you know, develop this for, for people, for archers. And so, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and it's great to, to, you know, know that, that, you know, there's guys like you, I'm, I'm sure very few um, that can help people once, you know, they find themselves in this situation, but, uh, you know, I guess part yeah, of what we would like to discuss sure. today is show. what, you know, preventively, what are the things that you see that, that help a ton yeah, as well? Right? That's going to come get to in that. We're going to get, we're going to get to that, Luis. I promise you, man. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm just getting excited over it's, here, man. I, I told so you I had a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. First part, the first part of this though, Joe, let's get this party started and head yep. over to our Elk Bros mailbox. Yeah, absolutely, man. Hey, Chav, you want to take that first one for us? Okay. Uh, the first letter or question comes from Alec Holchansky from Rochester, New York. Uh, wanted to get your thoughts on timing an elk hunt. I'm from Western, up, I guess it's upstate, upstate New York. Yeah, upstate. Yeah, and, yeah. and I'll be heading out west to hunt elk for the second time. I'm putting together hunt plans for a bunch of spots with a few that I figure will see significant pressure. So in your opinion, should I head out for the opener and hope to get on elk before they get pushed around and call shy or wait till the third or fourth week when the rut is on full swing and some of the hunters have burned themselves out. And, you know, we've discussed that before. Do we want to hunt early or do we want to wait a little bit? And I'm an early uh, guy. Yeah. I'm an early guy too. Uh, any thoughts on that from you guys? Well, I, I, I want to think about the fact that this guy's like, this is his second time, you know? Yep. So, you know, to me, when you got a, uh, a new elk hunter out there, it kind of depends on their skill set and their ability and understanding of, you know, <clears throat> how to deal with elk if they're quiet, man. I mean, if he doesn't have the skill set and if there's somebody that really needs to hear an animal to find an animal or there's somebody mm -hmm. needs to hear an animal to locate an animal, then I tell you to hunt. Might be better second. Yeah, later on because if anything, now at least you're going to hopefully, and let me tell you, things can happen in that late part too oh, where yeah. things shut yeah. up. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot better opportunity because you're going to have – Herd bulls are going to be herded up. You're going to have satellite bulls are going to be yelling at the herd bulls. So there's going to be opportunity. And I would change my focus, especially if I'm a second-year hunter. I'm going to let, you know, those bulls scream and take me to them, and I'm going to focus on some of those satellites, man, and yeah, and yeah. try to pull one also, Joe, you know? Also, Joe, I'd like our listeners when you and, – and I'm not ragging on Mr. Alec, but mm -hmm. I'd like for you when you send a question like this, please let us know what area of the country you're hunting in. I believe he's in Colorado, bro. I think – yeah, he's in Colorado is where he's going, I believe. Oh, okay. We didn't from, say uh, that first. Oh, I got you. Yeah, the, the other question I would have, too, is... This is out west. Uh -huh. Yeah, the other question I would ask, too, is, you know, depending on where you're hunting, I'm not sure where that, as far as weeks, when it overlaps with muzzleloader or maybe even no a rifle or anything like that, because if it's an area where all those types of hunts are allowed to that's a factor to think about as well because if it's just bow it's different but if if you got something else overlapping um uh, then then that's a factor to consider in my opinion yeah the, the elk are absolutely going to be their dumbest at the beginning right 100%. and you know they, they they haven't least, had they'll be pressure. least on edge for sure yeah and I mean, and that pressure that, puts them in a that pressure that you're talking about, Joe, puts them in a in a funk where they don't want to talk. 
you know, they will, but generally it's at night and early, early, late, late. And, and that's even a, another thing in its own right. Like you said, if you can call and you can get to them, it, that makes your chances for success a whole lot better. But if you don't have that skill set, it's tougher, especially when you can't hear them. Yeah, if you if you can understand that you can be calling an elk are still coming into you, and you got patience, and you under understand how to find sign, how to locate, how to do track, how to find the trails, and then how to be able to do call scenarios and things to bring those animals to you, then it's a different story, man. I mean, we love early on, and and we kill a lot of elk at the beginning. And you remember Gilbert, man? I mean, the first time that, you know, that you and I were going to hunt state land together and you asked me, I mean, you would always hunt the second part of the hunt and the end, you know, when bulls were screaming and stuff. And you saw some problem with that. I mean, they would be cowed up in big old groups and you could hear them screaming where they wanted to be. And that didn't mean they were going to be coming in. Right. So uh, it has its own set of problems, but and you were kind of wondering, you were like, well, I don't know, Joe, we always hunt the second part. And I was like, buddy, I always kill. And then we went on the first one and, <laughs> yeah. and, and well, rocked been them. Been that way ever since. Yeah. yeah. I've rocked them for sure. Yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it's been special. I, I, we like the first part. I mean, and that's just kind of where we're at. I mean, la- we went last year out of our, out of our comfort zone, went first part. And not only that went first part in, moved our camp the day before uh or the day of really opening day you know so it was uh it was crazy how how we set it all up but man you know you make a plan and you stick with it and i i I truly like the first part because whether the bulls are talking or not we're going we have a skill set that can get around elk you know and we're confident in that. And we and know that even that when we're talking, if they're not, they're still going to come in. And there's some you bulls know? talking too. There's some bulls talking. There's some young bulls. Yeah, you have a few, order. There's sure. different things happening. Now, you guys don't know this, but oh, Preston over here has taken a 350 class bull. Right, Preston? Wow. Oh, wow. I, yeah. Enjoy it. I have, yeah. Congrats, brother. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I actually that was, read that. That's way too cool, man. When, when do you yeah, like the. You. What's your favorite time of the season, man? That's a good question. I was just thinking of that. Um, I say, I mean, la- so yeah, last year I killed an elk on the opener on opening weekend, I should say. So that okay. early time is nice. Cause you can, you can get into them. I think, I think you, um, you hit the nail on the head though. It's a matter of if you have that skill set to be able to find them, recognize sign, then I think that early part is pretty good. Um, I don't think elk hunting has this allure of, I got to get in there. They got to be bugling and everything else like that. And I'd say the majority of the time, it's not like that. And, you know, you may not get a bugling bull, but you just got to sit there. You got a glass. I think you got to be willing to cover the distance, that first part. So what, so how early is your first part in Utah? So yeah, the early in Utah is it's the middle of August. Yeah. So it's the 20th. I think, I think this week, I think this year it starts on the 20th of August. It's kind of a little, screwy but yeah we start the 20th of august and end about the 21st of august uh september excuse me yeah. so when you kill a bull early like that are they still in velvet no, no uh you can get down. that you can get that you can get that first week um but you'd see the maybe the younger ones but they're all yeah i mean they're pretty much all rubbed out by that time yeah gotcha Gotcha. Yeah, the, the spikes uh, you, still have just like they are when we have them. And yeah. you can find a rag that's still going to have pieces hanging off and stuff like that, sure, you know, because sure, sure. It, it's always those bigger bulls that, that peel first and they go down, you know, and it's the same thing. They yeah. drop first and those smaller ones drop mm-hmm. later. So I think what I would cool. have to say is if this guy is serious about elk hunting and he's going to do it year after year after year, the more you can learn about elk, uh, the better off you are. And I think that the last hunt would be ideal for him because then he's going to learn what the rut sounds like, what cows sound like, where they're going to be, and he's going to take all of this in. So now he's got this knowledge, so maybe he can go out next year and go on the first hunt and try it and see what 
you know, now that he kind of knows what he's supposed yeah, to be trying to look and, for. And that's a good point. I mean, it's kind of like what we said with Gil. I mean, he, he gained experience in that exactly, second part. Exactly, yeah. And, it, and then mm-hmm. then converted that over to the beginning, man. So made it happen. Alec, I'll, yeah. also, Alec, I'll also let you know that I reach out to Joe. Some of our elk hunting coaches might be available at that time if you need an elk hunting coach in camp. So, uh, I don't want to get out in front of anything, but yeah, Alec, yeah, he might yeah. reach out to Maybe Joe. Maybe next year he, they he will. Maybe next somebody. year. Our coaches are all counted for this year, man. So <laughs> let's let's uh, go to the next one. And and guys, we know Drew. Drew's a, a friend of the Elk Bros. Um, yes, sir. And, and Drew Sarah is. Uh, What's so cool about Drew is he's got a hunting group, and these guys like do Zoom meetings to educate themselves and to talk about different things. And I mean, they are just—I mean, they're they're elk brother nerds, man. They just really get after it to learn. So I can appreciate that. And and he said this to him. He said my hunting group spent some time discussing potential pros and cons of facing towards versus away from each other on a cold blind on a cold calling or blind calling scenario, especially in instances when elk come in silently. And so when when he's talking about cold calling, for you guys that don't understand that, is basically cold calling is when you set up in an area um, because you, you know, you think there might be elk in there, but you haven't heard or seen anything. So that's why they call it a cold calling or a blind calling. You're just, now you either have seen sign or you smell or something like that that's giving you a reason to cold call and it could even be just because of um you're an area where you think it's going to get out reach out there maybe it's a type of funnel it kind of um reverberates through an area and and now can hear that in a distance and it's good for a cold calling and so he's saying when you set up let's say you have two of you you have three of you he says what are the pros and cons of facing towards each other you know because generally you're going to be about you know 30 40 yards apart you know, uh, you can be anywhere 20 to 40 yards apart, depending on what the terrain is like, what the vegetation is like. And you're doing this calling sequence where you're portraying a picture of for of different things that it, that the scenarios could be. We're not going to go into all of those. But uh, cold calling is generally going to start out with a lot of cow calls and stuff like that, right? So yeah. When you're doing that, is it better to face towards or face away from each other is what he's saying. And he says facing each other, he f- they felt like the pro. Obviously, you can see your partners and easily react to visual cues like hand signals and general body language. Con, you're relying on your partner to watch your six. So if an elk is coming in silently, someone will likely need to communicate to that blind partner so he can turn around and transition into a shooter role and one of the partners into a caller role. Also, if a partner can uh, see the elk coming in behind the blind partner, then presumably the blind caller is also within line of sight of the elk. He'll need to be careful repositioning and likely be depending on a partner to tell him when it's safe to move or the elk has gone behind a tree or something like that. Joe, are we talking bow? Yes. Rifle? Yeah, this is archery. Yeah. Archery. Yeah. Yeah. And then... And and these yeah. guys, I can tell you, man, these guys, I, I think they're kind of a little overthinking it, but, yeah. but it might be a Way good discussion thing. Yeah. All right. No, so. And but, but look, man, but I, I think I think the question is great. I I, I just yeah, you, you can go ahead and, and yeah. I'll, I'll let's I'll do the my facing away, out. and then we'll discuss yeah, the facing away. Yeah, facing away from each other. The pros: each hunter should have first and best opportunity to see or hear an elk approaching from their side, and is already in the proper shooting position. Our plan has been to simply have that partner stop calling as soon as there's an elk coming towards him. If the other partners hear that he's stopped calling, they should know that there's an elk approaching and they need to transition into a more of a targeted caller role. Even if the partners don't realize that the other has stopped calling, their continued calling scenario should keep the elk moving towards the calls and pass the now silent shooter. Con again is obvious and the inverse of above. You can't visually see and respond to your partners. How do you all set up in these situations? So, so yeah, and, and what I was going to say, I mean, you know, two, two things that I think are critical uh, before you're set up, obviously, is going to be the wind. Absolutely. To, and to Absolutely. the topography. 
There you go. So, you hit the so, two. Man, I'm proud of you, Luis. Uh, thank you, brother. I, I learned from you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Makes me yeah, feel I mean, good. Two, Send you a gold two major yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. yeah have so, those right or nothing's right. Yeah. I mean, so I think I think then based based on those two <laughs> things, you know, a lot of the answers to this will just kind of, you work know, come out. for the yeah, work themselves out. Exactly. Because I think it uh you know, the, the the if you're bow hunting, you can't be that far apart from each other anyway. I mean, I wouldn't say no more than fifty yards if if yeah, both you're, of you are hunting. Yeah, that's a scenario. That's yeah, and if and if the yeah. if it's very wooded, then you know it's going to make it harder. You may want to be closer, and you need to be closer anyway because if, if the bull is coming in, the bull is going is they might come in silent, but you're going to hear them before anything else. So I mean, you really don't need that three hundred and sixty degrees. You just need your ears. And you need to be kind of spinning your head anyway if, if you're in a, in, a, in a blind calling situation too, well, right? And, and I'll tell you that early in the year, like you're talking about, Luis, I've had bulls come in from behind me downwind. Like they must not have cut my wind until they got to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And all of a sudden I turn around, look, there's, there's a bull staring at us 60 yards away. Right. So we've learned and evolved over time that, yeah, we, if there's three callers in the set and we're putting on a scenario, we're going to have one guy looking at our six. Right. And then the other one setting out front. Now, if there's a bull that pipes up and starts coming out front, well, we'll reposition and get into that flying V and get after him. Right. But at the end of the day, yeah, you always want to watch your six. I can't tell you how many times I've turned around and looked. And there's, you know, Joe and I had that happen to us a couple of years ago. You know, we're out there calling and calling and calling. We got a bull coming in from our, our left-hand side, a big bull coming right to us. And we turn and look to the right, and there's four more bulls looking at us coming from our, our six over there on the right-hand side, right? So, I mean, it's just, yeah, you need to keep your head on a swivel. You need to, one, mind your wind, know your topography, and then set guys up like Joe's taught us in that flying V. I, I mean, I'm, I, we've had four four guys in the set before, uh, but generally it's three, you know? Yeah, but I think the challenge here that they're talking about, it sounds like there's just two. Yeah, even – and I'm not sure how many they have total in the group, whether right. it's two, three, or four, but, you know, really, to me, uh, th there's a couple things that I've heard. I – the, the head on the swivel you got to be careful about mm -hmm. you know yeah. uh you yeah, gotta let, we'll, yeah, we'll, you gotta we'll let your that. eyes do most of the looking for yeah. you gotta be careful with that um the other thing is is if i've got a wind that's blowing behind me you know i that's the spot i mean if it's blowing in my face i'm not worried about my about sit, what's behind man. me yeah yeah exactly. I'm, I'm not worried about that you know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be more worried about where it coming from across or coming from the mm -hmm. front area like that. So uh, myself, I like to have so that I'm not staring at my partner across there because, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, you've seen Gilbert. You can only do this for so long, right? You know, <laughs> sit there and stare, <laughs> stare at each other. Exactly. But, but uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but I, I like to see my, my partner in my peripheral. And I like yeah. to be able to cover an area more off to their an angle off of that person and not so much exactly. right behind them because my peripheral can catch everything off to his side in front and off to the side. And he's and, doing and the same thing towards my side. Just to clarify, you're in front, you're behind, you're right and you're left. Your peripheral are based on wind in your face. Correct. Yeah. When so you're terrain, facing because you're, yeah, and yeah. your terrain. Yeah. The, and your the terrain. Other thing yeah. is, is I want to put us in a situation where we're not seen until an animal gets within our shooting range, right? Yeah. So there, when you get in that, that's also going to help determine what you need to look at and cover. Because if you have a real thick mm -hmm. area in front of you, you're not going to have to worry about that, man. I can, yes. I can look off to another area where they're most likely to come from and watch my partner in the peripheral and they can see me. You know, like that. And you can definitely tell when your partner has spotted something because that bow immediately goes, Eep. I mean, mm -hmm. it, yeah. it goes from relaxed yeah. state yeah. to up, yeah. man. And you can just see mm -hmm. that, you, you know, you, you know, get that what I call that cougar look, you know. And the, and the going silent is, I think their point about going silent as a sign is great because that, sure. that that should sure. definitely be something that the other person should be aware of if that person goes silent and at that point you know just be careful if you're planning on making a move to kind of position yourself 
from behind where that person is, or if you happen to see the elk, you know, ideally, yes, you may want to make a move, but you just got to be really careful if they catch you moving, moving, you know, you can I, the whole set up. Yeah, for sure. You know, I hearken back to a couple years ago, Joe, where me and Brendan were set up with you, you were calling, had a bull down in front of us answer. And I mean, he was, it sounded pretty worked up and we knew he was coming. So Brendan, you know, kind of sprints over to the left, probably 45, 56, maybe 60 yards to my left, but he gets on the side of a tree and I can't see him. Right. Yeah. So a bull comes walking in and he's, I mean, he's walking in and look, we, we had already knew up front, we were going to let Brendan get, this is his deal. Right. The only time I'm, I'm not, I'm making the shot as if he misses or, you know, bull turns and comes to my direction. Right. right. We're really trying to work on Brendan getting this shot and the bull just walks right through the middle of our set. And I mean, He's standing 25 yards broadside from me, and I'm just standing there watching, waiting on Brendan to kill this bull. You know, I'm like, man, dude, I, I don't know what to do. Joe's done everything he can do. The bull's standing there looking, and I'm like, that bull is staring a hole through Brendan. And I'm like, I do not know why that bull is boogered like that and, and or staring straight at Brendan. I'm thinking, well, Brendan's going to kill this bull any minute because he's obviously at full draw, right? No, uh, uh, Brendan's been looking at him through his range finder the whole time and can't move. The bull has locked him up from 70 yards to 35, you know, and Brendan's like this and he's like, I don't want to move. You know, I'm like, well, with the, you know, that's like rule number one, you got to draw your bow to get a shot. But Brendan was worried that he was going to mess the whole thing up if he moved. Right. No doubt. If you move, bull's probably going to see you. But you got one guy behind you, Colin, and you got another guy to your right who's going to stop that bull if he boogers. And that's exactly what happened. When Brendan let his deal down, bull spun and boogered, and he went out there at 34 yards, and I cow called. And when I cow called, he turned broadside. Brother, let me tell you, I, I should have been able to close my eyes and let the arrow go. But I couldn't because I had my peep incident that happened to me that time where I couldn't see through that daggum peep. And that saved that bull's life. But again, we couldn't see one another. Joe could barely see us, but he knew by us being quiet and the bull shutting up that everything was you know, happening. Yeah, and, yeah. and, 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 and the point about yeah. seeing each other is so important there because we're all camoed up. Yeah. And it's That's so right. easy to lose the other guy, oh, you know, in the, the woods. Camo, and boys. you may be <laughs> so close because it happened to me and Manana. Like I started calling yeah. for him and I'm trying to look. And, you know, I turn around and start walking, looking for a branch and start raking the tree. And, and then when I start doing that, and then I start cow calling, and I look forward, it's like, where did Manana go? You know, and at first, I was like, where is he at? I couldn't find him. I mean, he was just like, it wasn't 40 yards from me. He was just sitting right next to a tree. I just real, couldn't you know, see And him it was real it was thick like, grass at that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It covered him pretty well. Yeah. But, uh, you know. I, I like the face in a way. My, my deal, Joe. Yeah. Uh, I like everybody facing away, looking in that direction of where that bull made a, made a peep or something like that. And yeah. Just, as long as you're not looking back so to where to the that. wind is going to. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, again, I, it, it's so easy. I would to pay say. less attention to my six. It, it, it's so easy to say, man, but you know, when you get out, the there, only time I would pay attention to my six, Joe, is if I'm got a draw behind me and that bull could come up out of that draw that, you know, yeah. he could get below your wind because your wind's passing over the top of him. You know, you got the thermals coming that's, up, that's, wind's that's passing exactly over the I'm top of him. what I'm talking about, though, is every yeah. situation Positive. is going to bring different yeah. variations. Yeah. So right. you got to play the wind, you got to play the terrain, and then you you yeah. set yourselves up so that you can best cover the area, um, be in the best shooting position if an animal comes from your side, and be in the best situation to be able to help your partner if you hear them go dry over there, right? So... Um, and hopefully an animal 
you know pipes up or you hear that that branch breaking if you and you can tell man if you hear a branch breaking behind you your partner's going to see your head turn and he's going to mm. go yeah i hear it yeah. right you, and then all focuses change i mean there's there's so much that happens that this is just one of those things that is just like so dry and generic that you can't really place it on every situation one because thing. i yeah. mean it depends on Changes. you know yeah it, I mean, it, that exact same scenario you're variables. talking about there joe happened to me last year with Monano mm -hmm. on that bull that we called in that came in from behind. And uh, that's the bull that Beto killed the following day. Right. Um, I was, I, we were, I was cow calling on some cows that were kind of down in front of us and Monano was in front of me. And then this bull came from behind and I stopped calling because I heard something coming from behind. So I stopped calling and slowly pivoted. And then I see this bull just kind of coming straight at me and uh, Manano just, you know, he, he noticed that I was quiet. He turned around, he tried to draw on the bull, the bull spooks, the whole deal. But I mean, more to, more to the same, same point. Yeah. Right? But if the bull doesn't see him and he gets to full draw bulls in big trouble, he had to do something, you know, not doing anything ain't going to happen, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm with Joe more times that you blow things up means, you know, you're getting closer to that. Y'all were doing the right thing to kill that bull. It just, it wasn't his day to die that day. Right. Right. Um, you know, I, doc, let me ask you a question. Do you guys hunt partners or do you hunt yeah. by yourself? Um, I do a lot of, I guess, a lot of both, but we have uh, my, my mostly partners, I guess I would say when gotcha. we're elk hunting. Um, How do you like that I, but setup? But Y'all but but face each think, other or face away? I think my two cents is, is when I killed my bull, um, we were in the same direction, had a collar behind me, right? My brother, my brother behind me, but then I guess actually, sorry, that's on the bull that he, um, that he killed that same year. And to me, I think that's a, that's a very, I guess, thought provoking question, a question yeah. that, um, I think is a little bit more comp more, a lot more variables. Cause I think yeah. to me, elk hunting happens. It's fast and furious. Like <sighs> I love, I'd love to say that I said, I'd love to say I set up correctly every time, but I think I don't and <laughs> elk come in all different directions. And yeah. like this last year I, I had my nephew, he's 14, he's 15 years old wants to kill an elk with his bow and this elk came in <laughs> just perfectly but just had her um it was a cow so we were cow hunting at this time we can kill a cow and she had her she was slightly quartering towards us and i'm thinking this is a perfect shot but it happened quick and for a young shooter it was just it just you know it's just fast and furious fast. and so yeah. to me i think there's a lot of variables and i think yeah. just being ready i do agree having that line of sight with each other is important, but I think as well, if you start spreading out too far, I think the way that the wind can change thermals, everything sure. else, I think it actually puts you, maybe sets you up for failure more because yeah. that wind's going to change if it does and it'll blow you and quicker remember, than- they're, they're talking about there. a cold call. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, when you hear, see, an animal, it's a totally different deal, man, than a cold call situation. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, you know what time it is. Shout out. Time shout for the Elk Bro shout, shout out. Out. If you're new to our show, this is just a shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week, Joe. Yeah. And before we begin, y'all, hey. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Yep. Yeah, no, keep pushing those weights, but keep listening, y'all. We would That's appreciate so it if you would take a moment to go to Apple Podcasts and give us a review. We haven't heard Please. from you in a while, man. We're like, uh oh. They, yeah, where are we? We're, 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 we're in trouble, man. What's going on, man? We must not be doing it, man. I I thought we were putting some good material, out, Gilbert, man, and and it's For like sure. we ain't getting no love, y'all. Come on, man. man. All right. <laughs> we had Papa Dale on, and we ought to be full and, of reviews. And, and now, especially now that we're doing way better, that Manano is not. Manano gone. <laughs> I mean, uh, you might have to bring Manano back. Uh, hey, Preston, why don't you start us out, bud, with a shout out to your hometown? I'll tell you, this is the craziest bunch of elk bros I've, I've hung out with. So definitely give a review because this is a good. Um, I'll give a shout out to my hometown, Sandy, Utah. Um, What's, I guess I would say the coolest part of my town right now is I am living at the base of 
the Wasatch Mountains. And it's an area that we can hunt elk from August until the middle of December. Wow. And so we get to hunt, we get to hunt elk into the late season. And I'll tell you, if you don't know the Wasatch front in Utah, then look it up and see some of the bucks that come off of it. Some of the biggest deer in the state come off the Wasatch front. Um, a big 230, wow. 40 inch deer came off it the other a uh, couple of years ago and about that wow. every year. So wow. I get to chase some sweet bucks and that's only, I'll tell you, that's 30 minutes away and I can be at 10,000 feet chasing some high country, high country nah. elk, high country bucks and then 30 minutes away and wow. I'm, I'm skiing. I think so we can wrap this show year. up. What, what trailhead is that? <laughs> so are the Wisatch to yeah, your east? Exactly. Are the Wisatch to the east of you there? Yep, the okay. Wasatch there to to the east. Yeah, exactly. So the I the Wasatch is I, to the east. Got gotcha. you. I look out my I can look out my front door, and last year I was looking out my front door, and I can glass up elk, and I can glass up um, some nice bucks in about November when they're rutting. So all right, so we good call tonight. it good uh, for tonight. Yeah, sure. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so around the Cottonwood Heights, around the Cottonwood Heights area. Exactly. Yep. Gotcha. Oh, that's awesome. So man. cool, man. Congrats. Quiet. It's uh, it, way it, nice. It, it's over there on the south side of, of Utah, everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. the yeah. southern yeah. Eight. That, There's nothing there's nothing good here. <laughs> gotcha, brother. Make it rock, chap. Okay. Uh known as the the low rider capital of the world, this week's top listening city is located along the fertile banks of the Rio Grande or Rio Grande in north central New Mexico. The region, a stronghold of the Tiwa Pueblo Indians, was explored by the Spanish in 1540. Settle, settlers followed in 1598, and it is considered to be the first si uh, capital city founded by people of European racial descent in what is now the United States. The city is bordered by four Pueblos that still exist today, Ok, Oinge, Powaki, Santa Clara, and San El Defonso, and this is in Española, New Mexico. Española, New Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, check out the home state, Joe, showing hey, up, baby. So get this, man. I was so, hey, Española in the house, man. That's I am awesome. so proud of you. Espanola. I don't know what they did. I don't know who called exactly. who, but they had a doggone download party in Espanola. They doubled the amount of downloads of Denver this oh this wow wow yeah yeah and no, i'm that, like that's hard to do man i'm like in, 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 if, they, in Colorado, if they hear you pronouncing espanola they may stop doing that no, point no, forward no no, no bro <laughs> we need to fix they know, that they know venezuela place man this is this is new mexico Jeez. you thought i said milk bros a little while ago <laughs> <Milk> too, bro. <laughs> espanola <laughs> and go. so when when i first came to new mexico there was there was a two lane highway going through Espanola, and if you went through <laughs> yeah, there at the wrong time, at the wrong time, it was going to take you All day. hours to get in <laughs> from one end to the other because at night. They the all ride. came out, man. Oh, yeah. The low riders hit the hit the road, yeah. and and I mean they were in, wow. incredible vehicles, man. Oh, I mean yeah. it uh, it was showtime, mm -hmm. you know. I had a poor boy's low rider. I throw about twelve cinder blocks in the back of my trunk and <laughs> deflate my back tires. <laughs> it worked out good. Gilbert, yes, sir. Joe, this next top list in the city. That's right, people. It's from the Lone Star State. Y'all get it right. It's situated near the <laughs> Texas Gulf Coast and located between the city of Houston and the Galveston Island area. This top listening city's name is home to several water slide resorts, such as the South Shore Harbor Resort, Waterford Harbor, and the Houston Yacht Club Marina. Originally, the site of the Karankawa Indian Village in 2013, the financial website, uh, Nerd Wallet, Nerd <laughs> named this city the best city in Texas for people looking for a job. It is the home to two NASA astronauts, Doug Hurley and Karen Nyberg, and this is in League City, Texas. You League better city. understand. League City. Just south of H-Town. About halfway between H Town and Galveston. You better understand. You know it. That's right. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, that's great, city. man. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm glad you got to announce that, Gilbert. Man, it makes you me too. Better. I'm glad the but, Texas but, boys are showing up. But yeah. but I want you to know who was in the top position this week was Nuevo Mexico, buddy. <laughs> yes, we love our brothers to the north and the west. Yeah, there you right. go. We, uh, it's all the same. This northwestern California city is located at the mouth of Elk Creek, where it flows into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, the city harbors is crescent-shaped and a center for its fishing, crabbing, tourist, and timber industry. In 1964, four tsunami waves generated by the Great Alaska Earthquake destroyed most of the city. And then in 2011, an earthquake in Sendai, Japan, sent another tsunami that created extensive damage to the city's harbor. And none other than Crescent City, California. Crescent, Crescent City, California in the house. Yeah, and I don't know if you've traveled along some of that coastal area where the, they have all the tsunami signs, warnings, and, you know, I mean. Freaks you, know, you out. It's a it real does. deal, it's right? It's a real deal, is right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, it, it, it's amazing that an earthquake in Japan. Oh, yeah. Does. Yeah, can cause that wave to come all the way across, across the, ocean the ocean and ocean. hit like that. Unbelievable, man. I, I, it's just south there of Pelican Bay, Joe. You know, uh, I mean, just in the very northern part of California there. Pretty yeah, cool. right. Yeah, pretty awesome all there. So even yeah. though our next top listening city has been known for the production of different things such as automobile parts and plastics, blue at jeans one time it was the largest producer of blue jeans in the world. So now now we've hit on what's important, right? Yeah. <laughs> blue yeah. jeans, man. Yeah, we got to know where this is. Yep. Residents and tourists yeah. alike celebrate an annual powwow festival and the Old Timers Day. The powwow is a special occasion for Native American tribes to gather to honor and share traditions with one another and the pull up and the in the public and the blah 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 man, man. public please quit yeah. drinking it's a fair yeah. i like a picasso uh, in columbia city indiana all right columbia city indiana and you man, know they're the midwest uh, showing up and they're not the only one has a big powwow we have a giant powwow here in new mexico that brings all the tribes and i mean uh in october mm. and Albuquerque. that was a kumbaya man yep yep <laughs> It's a. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. You don't know what it is. <laughs> kumbaya. You don't know what a kumbaya is. I, I'm just saying. It's nice just talking. Joe, our next top listening city is located is part of, in it is part of the Colorado Spring, Springs metro area, bordered by the Pike National Forest to the west, Colorado Springs, and the Air Force Academy to the south. The foothills and rock outcroppings to the north, I-25, uh -huh. to the and the rolling plains to the east. It is first settled as a railroad stop for the Rio Grande Railroad and what or Rio Grande Railroad and was named Henry Station in 1879. Three years later, it was renamed and a after a nearby rock formation in Monument, Colorado. Yeah, Monument. Monument. Yeah, and it, Monument, Colorado. Monument, Monument is a beautiful place oh, in between Springs yeah, and, absolutely. and yeah. Castle Rock. Mm -hmm. or, and right? Yeah. You Probably think it's somewhere pretty, around there, Joe? Yeah, you think side. it's pretty monumental? <laughs> it is monumental, bro. And I believe they have a lake, Monument Lake, there as well. Yeah, I love yeah, it when I love it when RC is on the on the show, man, because he laughs at everything. It makes me feel good, <laughs> even if the joke is pretty bad. I know RC is going to laugh and you know have a good time. Oh my gosh! All right, guys, let's get to the content. This is what we came for right here, man. And uh, and. So you're on, Preston, and this one is about o avoiding and dealing with injuries that affects us as elk hunters. So uh, the first thing that I want to talk about, and, and you probably see this with the people that you deal with, Preston, is that there's a direct correlation between hunting success and how we feel physically. Would you say that's correct? Yes, Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Like I, I mean, I mentioned this earlier, the best investment you can make is in yourself and people that um, don't feel good, whether it's physically or even mentally. I mean, and, and I think we hear, I'm, I'm going to jump on this side note as well, really quick that um, I, I do some work with the USA archery team. And 
Um, we hear about archery being, you know, 100% mental. And though I do agree that the sport of archery is mental, there's a large part. If you're not physically prepared, then um, mentally you won't be prepared either. So anyways, yes, I do see that correlation for sure. So you're saying that these Olympic athletes, they just don't go and just shoot all day? That's not what their training is, just popping paper all day long? I mean, they have to do other things to be ready to be world-class uh, athletes? Well, I... I know it's a question for Dr. Ward, but my, my humble opinion will be you, in order to have the discipline to do that, you have to be mentally right. And then having the muscle memory to do it right every time would also positively affect your, your mental state for the competition. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I think that's absolutely right. But I, at the same time, when I think about a hunting scenario, I'll jump back to that. If, if people aren't prepared, if they're not prepared physically and, you know, they're injured, whatever it might be, they're not prepared physically, then mentally they may be going into this thinking, man, can I really make it that far? Can I make it that, can I make it those four miles into the back country? Uh, man, what if I get one? Can I get it out? Or man, what if my shoulder bugs me again? Am I going to be able to draw my bow back in that moment of, you know, truth? And so I think, that physical preparedness, mental preparedness, it's all, it's all there. And they both piggyback off of one another. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it, it adds to the uncertainty and then the, you know, you, you start doubting yourself in, in a different levels. So I agree with you, man. That makes perfect sense. Those injuries affect a lot of things. I mean, if, if you're having trouble with the shoulder, you're having trouble with a hip, a back, something like that, you're not getting good sleep at night. And if you're not getting good sleep at night, getting up at three o'clock in the morning, really starts to suck man so that sleeping blanket starts to feel a little bit better and that sleeping bag you want to stay in it and you know next thing you know now you're missing out on opportunities to locate animals so you know uh and those naps in the woods get a little bit longer you're cutting down on your hunting time and if you're cutting down on hunting time then you're cutting down on opportunity so yeah. all of that rolls into each other right yeah you know if you're out of breath at the top of a mountain and elk's coming in, you can't draw your bow. Draw your bow at that point. Well, how how many people too? You know, they're, they're up on a ridge and they hear an animal down in the bottom of this crap hole down there, and they're like, "Nope, uh, uh-uh, uh, not the way. I'm I'm not gonna make." How many it? people you know pretend like they didn't hear anything after you know a bugle? <laughs> goes off of 10 miles away for at, at the end of the day and joe turns around looking for to see if somebody heard something and manano and i go hmm? yeah. <laughs> and you know that's that's one thing that i that you know i, I want to bring up is that when people end up avoiding pain grinders tuning in thank you for listening to the blue collar elk hunting podcast Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our base camp elk hunting training camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our base camp training camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, 
Invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing and achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. If they have to avoid pain, if it's happening in their hips, and let me tell you what, that's something that's not brought up a lot. Um, but there's dudes that you can go out and you can jog and stuff like that, but you get weight on your back and you start going down hills. Uphills aren't as bad. You start going down hills and you start pounding your hips, you start pounding your knees. You know, next thing you know, man, your 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 hip area is just sore as can be. You start walking differently. You start, you know, you're not as efficient. You get tired out, and so that start all of that. It starts to affect your mindset. So believe it or not, there's a lot of things that if you don't prepare your body for, you don't do maintenance for, it's going to affect your mindset because it's going to create limitations out there in the field. And, and, and I think, Joe, that applies not only during the hunt, but prior to the hunt as well. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I love that, Joe, you bring up the hips and the knees because – I'll tell you that is, I, I, that, I mean, that's a slam dunk. I'll say nine out of 10 times people guys come to me who are preparing for a backpacking hunt. They've got knee pain, they've got hip pain and we focus on the right, the right muscles. I mean, as long, I mean, if you guys go put a pack on a 60 pound pack on, or even a 50 pound pack on, or carry out a, a hind quarter, you start feeling it right on those hip muscles. And most of the time it's because those muscles aren't conditioned enough and um, not strong enough. And so what's I really believe in as far as not just strength training, but also strength, I guess I'd say strength training to a certain percentage. Everyone there, we have the cool thing about um, what I do is there's very known statistics. You need to have your hip muscles this strong compared to your body weight. Now, maybe we should think about it this way. If you know they need to be this strong compared to your body weight, then they need to be this strong compared to your body weight plus a little extra because you're carrying a 50 pound pack. And so um, when people come to me with knee pain and hip pain, I just am thinking, yes, this is going to be a slam dunk because we focus on those muscles and people get better and they have less pain going down hills. And so anyways, I, I think that's awesome. Well, it's a lot of hip flexibility, hip mobility and hip strengthening. And I, I think, I think that's the one thing that a lot of people are sh on the short end of the stick on is, is, the flexibility and mobility along with the, with the strengthening, you know, and I, for, for my example, right. I mean, here I was doing a lot of different type of shoulder things, you know, trying to make sure I got through every season, but because I didn't have, I didn't understand where the specifics were of what muscles needed to be strengthened to give support and to get blood flow going just having that little bit of knowledge like that has changed everything for me, you know, and it's, it's given me a whole new life up in the mountains up there. Now that it comes to my bow, I mean, it, it went to the point that as an, as a instinctive archer, I shot 80 to 120 arrows a day in a session. Right. And it got to the point last year where 15 arrows, 20 arrows, 30 arrows, and I was toast because I wasn't using, I was recruiting in order to get where I need to. And and we do that. And then we, you know, if, if we start to have a problem with the foot, then we recruit the other side of the body to take pressure off of that foot. And now because we've recruited those muscles from the other side, we start using them to a max rather than sharing the load and we actually create an injury trying to take you know trying to take pressure off of an injury and i i think that's something that a lot of people don't realize preston yeah absolutely i um we call that compensation right so you start doing something it hurts so then you start compensating with the other side and then that kind of you know the other side starts feeling better but then that side starts hurting and then soon, I guess both sides hurt and then you compensate further, you know? And so absolutely. I see that a hundred percent where 
I get these hunters, backpackers, you know, archers, and they have an injury. They think that it's going to get better and it maybe doesn't. And then here coming up in the next couple of weeks, you know, with hunting season, a couple, a couple months away, I get these phone calls says, Hey, you know, reach out to me. I, you know, my back hurts, my knee pain, you know, whatever it is because they've kind of delayed that rehab we'll say and i like to use i mean obviously as a physical therapist i like to use that term rehab because oftentimes it's just the knowledge like you said educating you these are the muscles this is the area this is where we're trying to target that blood flow load the tissues up accordingly and you'll have less of those injuries and so from a injury standpoint i'll say most most things, whether it's overuse injury, it's from, you know, doing too much. It can be as simple as a tennis elbow or archer's elbow, we call it. It can be shooting your bow way too much, right? And so you can get an injury that way. Well, sometimes that injury is because you're weak or sometimes it's because you're overdoing it right there and other muscles are weak. And so it's a matter of putting the whole entire body together and um, looking at the movement from top down. Right. So that's why when I see people, I'm like, let's look at all the motion. Let's look at all the strength from the top down, really. So let me you ask know, I, I think I think it's important that you bring bring up that term up um, because I, I tell my, my boss every day about compensation and he just he doesn't seem to be getting my point yet. And, and why are we laughing? Isn't that what we're talking about here? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Doc, one of the things I find that most archers do is. They, they pull too much poundage. They're not strong enough to really yeah. sustain what, what they're, and it, it's not like they can't get strong enough to do it, but everybody wants to get to that 70, 80 pound bow mark. And I mean, you don't have to, you know, you get the right setup. You get somebody like yeah. Luis designing your, some great arrows, a really good setup. You know, my son blows through animals at 60 yeah. pounds. You know? So, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. it's yeah. uh you don't have to, a, a lot of guys, I watch a lot of guys and I take, you know, I guide guys hunting and they get in a blind with me and they can't draw their bow back. They've never drawn from a seating position, right? They've never had to draw from the seating position. They've never had to draw from kneeling or something like that. It's just totally different for them. And I, I tell guys all the time, if you cannot sit on a stool and with your feet off the ground, draw your bow back with very little movement, you got too much poundage. Yeah. If you got yeah. to make all I'll kinds of big movements and stuff like that, that's just compensating, like you're talking about, for the lack of strength in the other areas. So tone that thing down and listen to Doc right here to tell you how to get a little stronger so you can make that thing right for yourself. Yeah, if you if you're in the if you're in the pig blind and destroying the destroying the blind, right, Joe? Um, <laughs> um, Look, I, I'm not. Hey, making, man, I'm we not never. Hey, fun. man, we never said names, dude. I'm I mean, not making fun of anybody. I'm but sorry. Look, yeah, my no, buddy, my buddy is the first. Up. My buddy that's a first time bow hunter, and Joe's guided him before. RC Knox has guided him before. His name is Bruce Gainer. We love him to death. The first time I ever took Bruce Gainer bow hunting, deer hunting, I put him in a ladder stand, and I came back and I said. Bro, did you, did you see anything? I mean, I put him in the hot spot. You know, I knew there were deer coming in there. And he goes, oh, my God. He goes, I saw all kinds of bucks coming in here. I said, well, did you shoot one? He goes, man, the strangest thing was happening to me. When I'd go to draw my bow back, they'd all run off. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, man, when I'd go to draw my bow back, they'd all run off. I said, well, draw your bow back for me. Uh, and he goes, yeah. Oh, he finally gets it back. I'm like, oh my God, bro. I'm like, yeah. Bruce, you can't do it. He goes, well, I can't draw it any other way. I'm like, whoa, man. So what was the problem? Yeah. I, don't, I don't understand. But, uh, <laughs> I'm like, bro, you know, we got to turn that thing down. He wasn't strong. And look, Bruce Gaynor's an athlete, right? Really avid tennis player, cross country guy, but was not strong where it needed to be to yeah. pull his bow back at 70 pounds. And he didn't need it at yeah. 70. But that leads to my question here on that, Beto, is that, okay, so new, I'm a new bow hunter, look, and, and, and brand new bow hunter, I want to get out there, 
give you an example. I want to get a bow and I want to, you know, I want to pull as much as I can pull right out of the bat and get the fastest bow mm-hmm. that I want to get. Cause I don't know much about it, but I know that the harder that bow is good, that, that bow is going to pull the more power is going to have. And so obviously there are ways to prepare yourself for a certain poundage and ways to build your muscles to where you can get to a certain poundage that is adequate for you. And I'm sure you've worked with a lot of, you know, patients that where you've gone through that and, and what is your thought process or your training advice or your recommendations on, Hey, start here. Yeah. Work this way to get great here. Qu- great question. Luis. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I, I mean, I think a really quick to jump on this. If you are, it's cool to shoot. 80 pounds. It's cool to shoot 90 pounds. That's what a lot of, you know, that's what Joe Rogan's doing. That's what um, Cameron Haynes. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're fit and if you're strong, like those guys are, are. and I think that's awesome that they are. Do you need to do that? I don't think so. I think you can get away with the 60 pound bow, you know, and I wish I was shooting a 60 pound bow. I'm shooting a 70 pound bow, but um, so there so I have nothing wrong with them shooting the, you know, you, they kind of get a lot of crap too of, yeah, they're shooting too much. They don't need to. And I think, you know, no, if that's what they want to do, uh, great, fine. but they're yeah. fit. They, tr- they yeah. train, they train every single day and that's totally yeah. fine. What happens and where we see this is people who don't train every day, they yeah. say, oh, I get a, you know, I got an elk hunt coming up and maybe I'll go to total archery challenge or any of these 3d events, mountain archery fest, and I'll shoot a little bit there. And they don't train every day. So it is important, Luis, to, to train those right muscles. And so as far as starting out at a 50 pound, 60 pound, it depends, you know, if you're a, if you're a new, if you're a brand new, then I do not recommend saying, let's go right to 70 pounds. Now, if you're fit and you're strong and we do some testing and you can pull it back, then sure. I don't think that's going to hurt, but, um, I will say the problem with that though, one Preston, thing, is, is that bows most- that bows cost so much that people are like, well, you know, I don't want to buy a bow that I'm going to grow out of. So, I mean, but there's bows that you can go sixty to seventy, right? Oh, and, all day. and even less most than sixty. Of the bottom, most of the bottom side sixty on you know yeah. fifty five. And with 80, 85 percent lead off. Go, on yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, in another point to that, aside from from you know, and I'll let you finish here in a second. But it's you know, think about if you start out way too heavy right off the bat with no injuries. knowledge of it. Not only you can hurt yourself. You let's say you're in shape to do so, but your form you're not you 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 may you may hurt your form if you don't start Develop from a lower habits. poundage to really understand how you should be drawing uh, before you progress habits. up but i'm sorry mr war uh, dr war go ahead no absolutely i i agree 100 percent. it's it comes down to form so if someone can draw a 70 pound bow and they're a new shooter great do it let's make sure you have good form let's go through some coaching let's make sure you know shooting with um correct tension you're going through the whole shot process and so that's totally i totally agree but yes you can turn down the limbs i usually don't recommend i mean i don't necessarily don't recommend it but i don't do that i say you know let's choose something a certain poundage let's say someone wants to start shooting and they start shooting at 65k that sounds great they want to get up to 70 or they want to shoot at 70 let's train those right muscles make sure you have good form and make sure you get those repetitions in, right? So I always make sure I do what's called bow dosing, right? Or arrow dose, I call it arrow dosing, where I'm dosing the amount of arrows they're shooting so they don't get that overuse injury, but they're also getting enough tension and time with that bow. Say that again, Um, say that, repeat that again. So, sorry, I call it arrow dosing, where you're shooting enough arrows not too many arrows you mentioned that you shot when you're instinctive shooting 100 120 plus arrows you know a day now maybe that's great and that's what you should be shooting but someone probably starting out can't do that absolutely and get a prescribed number of shots per day get a prescribed number of shots per day an arrow a a dose a, a recommended dose right you get a recommended dose for ibuprofen whatever it is um you get a recommended dose of arrows as well And then the most important thing is when I'm building plans like this, there's some time off as well. There's some time off. There's some rest days and that's totally fine to let the muscles recovery, uh, recover, excuse me. Now with that, 
on those rest days or even in there, there is specific exercises that need to be done that need Stretching. to be strengthened. When you're talking about um, archery, archery is a physical sport. And though people are like, oh, it's only a one-sided shoulder sport. It's not like I train both sides equally. If, if wow. they're doing an, if they're doing an exercise called, you know, bow draws where you're literally taking an exercise band and just drawing, just drawing mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. Then I'm doing it on the other side too, even though they don't shoot yeah. left-handed. And then um, with that said, um, a lot of people think that it's primarily just, you know, the rhomboids, the shoulder, the muscles in between your shoulder blades, the scapula. Um, and those, though those are very important muscles, there's other way important muscles as well as far as like the rotator cuff. Now, um, the rotator cuff muscles, what they do is they stabilize that, that hum- they stabilize that humerus, right? They pull it down and avoid those compensations. And then you have your posterior deltoid. So if you're in a, if you're in a good shot right here, you know, if you're, if you're anchored and everything and you're in a shot in this position, not so much the rhomboids that are continuing to squeeze. I'm already, I'm already in that position. My rhomboids are already tight. They're contracted what they're doing is they're preventing that scapula from moving all over the place, right? That's a, it's a stable position. So now I'm here. And as I continue to work with that back tension and continue to follow through with my elbow, then I'm here. And it's that deltoid that continues to pull that around along with the serratus anterior and other things like that to maintain the mechanics. But hey, doc, you're so there's a lot of around a lot of Greek there. Oh man. I was going to say, dude, I feel like I'm starting oh, like sorry. all over again. Yeah. I was like, man, yeah. I, I felt this Anatomy way in me class a few <laughs> years ago. When I was starting and English and, 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 <laughs> and, and getting intense here. <laughs> That's some good stuff though. Yeah. This is where I, this is where I geek out. And when I die, when I, <laughs> kill, when I, I, like when I kill an animal, when I kill an animal and I'm looking through, I'm dis- I'm literally di- over there dissecting the animal because I, I love it. My diaries too, awesome. man. She, oh, look at this, yeah. man. She's but all I think, over But I think for our Anyways, listeners listen. out there, if you could help us out, Doc, just for them, like when you start to talk about an area like that, if you could say like the top area of the shoulder or the back, uh, the yeah. you know, the back of the arm or the yeah, forearm or something like that. So it kind of helps them to, to in their mind. Translates that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll dumb it down. Oh so man, we, I like it, man. It's just to see the passion come out when you're talking about all yeah. that. It's pretty impressive. So <laughs> for sure. you gotta dumb so, it down for me, bro. <laughs> uh, uh, so the, what I'm talking about is the. I mean, when you're at when you're anchored and you're you know in that full position, the back your muscles behind your in between your shoulder blades they're stable, they're contracted, so those need to be strong. And then you have your deltoid, which is basically the muscle on top of your shoulder right there. There If you you grab your shoulder, then um, you grab your opposite shoulder, your fingertips would be touching that posterior deltoid. And that's what's important for as far as continuing that execution. And so there's great exercises out there. I mean, people, if they're not, if they're not training, and I would argue if you're an archer and all you're saying is I'm shooting my bow and I'm shooting 200 arrows a day, a lot of the professionals they're shooting two or 300 arrows a day to get good. And they're good. I'll tell you what, it's fun to watch the target archery because they're good. They're shooting a lot of arrows. Um, but it's important to do the, the strengthening as well. If you're not doing it, you know, on a daily basis or a few times a week, at least odds are you're going to have a shoulder injury six. This is from some research, some data, which, um, I love diving into is, you know, 60% plus of people will have shoulder injury shooting a bow. Now, whether it limits you from a season yep, sure. or whether it limits you for, or it limits you from a couple hours of, you know, or maybe a couple of days of shooting or a competition, one competition. Yeah. That varies, but yeah. 60% of people will complain of shoulder pain. Now, what I'm hoping is that people don't have that. They can avoid it so that it doesn't interfere with a season. You know, my motto is, you know, never miss a season train with mountain physio really so um i'll What's say that good, like, is there a good rule of thumb to avoid that i mean how how do, uh, how, do how do you know what your limit is i mean well you know, I, I i think Luis, though it it's not so much it's not so much the limit i, I and i what he's saying is it's kind of like if you add some of this preventive some of this maintenance type exercising yes. then you know, when we talk about the softball and baseball, we talk about arm care. 
right? Yeah, where we're absolutely we're warming man. the arm down, learning how to decelerate the arm muscles, right? Not just build them up, but you know, what we do when we throw a ball is so bad for our shoulders. And the the care that you give the arm arm through deceleration is just as important as it is, is to accelerate it through there, right? So and I think he I think Doc's on to something very yeah. specific when it comes to, to bow hunters in what could be some real preventative exercises we could do to help yeah. strengthen the areas that are that are really important for archers, right? Absolutely. And that I mean I, I'll say this time and time again, like I my hope my goal is to unfortunately I hope it's to work myself out of a job, right? I say that kind of jokingly because um that'll we're never about happen. No. We're talking as about long compensation. as we keep and, having pandemics, our population is going to go through the roof, <laughs> Doc. So you in good shape. And, and that's why and that's why I say it jokingly is because my goal is to to teach archers. I want people to do things the right way. And mainly because not that it's bad, but there's the, there's a right way to load it. There's a right way to dose it. I see it all the time where other people are, you know, whether they're giving exercises or not, or it's not an appropriate load because it's not enough. Um, so that's where my specialty lies is like, we got to make sure it's the right load at the right time, enough rest and things like that. But that's why I kind of joke about that. Cause I know it won't happen, but I hope to, I hope to teach people. I hope to, you know, give people the right exercises and these few little, sorry, excuse me, these few little ones to maintain, or you can start now and maybe your shoulder feels better. I've had so many people, it's really cool to reach out to me, whether they went and got an MRI after and they're like, you were right on, or, Hey, I did these exercises and, you know, surgeon says, this is exactly what I should be doing. Or, you know, I can delay a sh shoulder surgery, or I've been able to avoid a shoulder surgery altogether. I had that happen this year. And it was just a music to my ears right if you can delay us sure. rewarding if you can, if you can yeah. avoid a shoulder surgery that's awesome yeah so let me ask a question so you're pulling a 60 pound bow and first one's perfect you can do it second one you're starting to have to pull you have to do everything wrong in other words your form is completely out of whack do you recommend taking that bow and turning it down. If I understand what you said, rather than turning the bow down to where you can shoot maybe four or five consistently perfect, rather than doing that, just do that one every day. Is that correct? Or? Yes, I, I, see, I see where you're coming from. Um, if they could do one, I would probably turn it down a little bit, but where, I'll, and I'll tell you, this is how I practice, I guess, is people come to me, they have shoulder pain or they're shooting their bow and they're like, you know, it hurts or they do whatever. It, there's some pain um, because of an activity or we're trying to figure out what that activity is. I'm under the understanding, and this is kind of my, I guess I'll say my personal, my motto of, of practicing is, I don't want to tell people no, and I don't want to tell people take something away from them yet. So meaning if you can do one and it's good and you can, and I give you some strengthening exercises, I give you the right program. I know that my program is going to work and you do it and we're not making progress. Then I say, okay, now let me step in. Let's take this down. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah. I mean, so I don't want to, I don't want to jump in immediately because I think, I mean, honestly, if we think about coaching from a coaching perspective um, and a learning perspective, the best learning is, is self-reflective. You're learning it yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I can teach you and tell you that, or I can say, Hey, drop your bow down. Um, and um, dial it down, dial it back, right? Decrease the, the, the draw weight. Or you can shoot and then you can do the exercises and then yeah. you can shoot again and do the exercise. And if you get stronger without me interjecting as much, you've learned more. Right. And so, I mean, it, it's situational, I would say as well. Like I agree. I think, it, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I was going to say, there, there's all, I mean, there's always reps in a bow is very important reps in a bow is super important the best training i think you some of the best training you can do is just shooting your bow and so so absolutely i agree um 
dial it down so you can get some arrows. And that's where I put together these programs. It's like, okay, now let's get some arrows in. But I mean, if you can shoot one or two arrows, good arrows, and then you can train for three weeks. And then the next week, you know, those in three weeks, you can shoot five or six arrows, then great. I, I like what you said, because I think, you know, you, you're putting the coaching portion to it too. And the last thing you want to do for a client that comes to you with maybe not something physically that impairs them to like draw their bow, but maybe with a goal of being able to draw a certain poundage and then, you know, needing to work the muscles. The last thing you want to do is telling them, well, if you only drew it once, you know, you may want to turn down your bow because that's not coaching them through making their muscles stronger so they can achieve their goal versus yeah. telling them, Hey, we can get you there, but this is how we need to get you there. Right. And I think yeah, that's they're just your guys approach. that are going to start out with too much poundage yeah. and they can't draw well, it. It's, it's and they're going to injure themselves when they keep trying. Yeah. You know? it, it's Got a turn it's somebody going to the bowling alley and going long. and finding the heaviest 16 pound ball yeah, yeah, the yeah, alley yeah. And, and trying to go down it. You know, it, it's Again. about, it's about finding what you can use effectively, yeah, yes. efficiently with the best form possible. So if, if you're, if you're shooting and your form starts to break down, it's time to stop. But here's the thing about yeah. it is, is that when you're shooting a bow, you're using multiple muscles. So now you might stop shooting, but now you can go and exercise each of those muscles Definitely. to strengthen Definitely. them up individually without being in a, to a total mm -hmm. movement that's going to add to that total movement when you get there. You know, And the, the thing I wanted to bring up too, I, I, I wanted to ask you, Doc, what are the most common injuries areas that you see occurring mm -hmm. on, on hunters and mountain athletes? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, the last thing I want is to speak really quickly on that is the last thing I want is an injury. So if people are overbowed, I have a YouTube video on this of way that I think that people can um, test if they're overbowed or not sitting up against a wall, right? You mentioned sitting in a stool. There's different ways of doing that. But the last thing I want, area. the last thing I want is an injury. Um, so R repeat your question sorry the yeah so and and i used injury but a lot of times people think they're injured when they really have something that's nagging what's the most or, common uh, injury common, yeah common injury thank but, you thank you yeah, the yeah, most yeah. common so the, yeah. the most common areas that you end up dealing with and trying to strengthen up yeah thank you sorry um so the most common injuries in in archery in general obviously most people think when they have a shoulder pain Ah, oh, shoot, it's my rotator cuff, it's gone. I gotta go have surgery. Yeah. And I'll say 99% of the time, that is not that is not the case. Not the case. Now with young art, I say with young archers, I'll say the most common is the bicep tendon. So typically the front of your shoulder, right? Um, your bicep tendon um, has two different two different connections. We have someone here that knows about a bicep tendon recently, but two different connections up high. And that yeah. can get irritated. Now, mainly I see that when they're, when a young archer wants to shoot 75, 80 pounds, they, um, they crank up, they crank up their limbs. And when they're drawing, they are way overbowed or they're getting that shoulder, that draw, we call it string arm and bow arm. So that string arm is way too far in front of them. And they're getting some actual compression on that bicep. And so that's a very, very common issue. So the bicep tendon, number one. Um, older archers tend to now, have some now over... before you go there, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but before one of the reasons is that is because they're not using both arms to push, push and pull on the bow. They're trying to go straight out and just use one arm to bring back. Correct. I will say that a hundred percent of the time. And I have some, a YouTube video up on there on like proper way of drawing a bow from what's I'll that say, channel from a, a, it's a mountain, uh, physio? Mountain, mountain physio on youtube and i'll say it's a proper way of drawing a bow from a biomechanical perspective right and so i think from the coaching that i've learned and done and things like that as well as like from a biomechanical like let's just avoid injury this is how you draw a bow but anyways um so yeah i see it when people are not when they have that arm fully extended they have now to if you're talking a, you know, six and three quarter, seven inch brace height, they got to get that arm way far in front of them to draw back. And they think 
people think archery is just pulling with one arm straight back and it's not it's a combination of a push pull you know, letting this mm-hmm. push pull letting the scapula kind of relax and down and settle so yeah, you're not using your traps your and so yeah, so anyways, yeah, that's the question. And then, or the answer, then the the other one would be rotator cuff. I mean, I see a lot of rotator cuff injuries. Um, as we age, now this is just talking about, you know, age in general, the, the occurrence of rotator cuff tears is very common. But when I think of a rotator cuff tear, I don't, I don't want people thinking I got shoulder pain, it's my bicep tendon or my rotator cuff tear. Um, because a lot of times it's the tendons or it's, it's an unhealthy rotator cuff. Now, a rotator cuff is not like a piece of paper. I'm looking for one right now. It's not just completely flat, right? It's three-dimensional. So you have, um, it can tear from the underside and just partially fully. Yeah. And even some, I'll tell you what, like full thickness rotator cuff tears. I rehab them all the time. They can have excellent range of motion. They can still shoot a bow as well. And so I don't want people thinking like, oh, my shoulder hurts. I've got a bicep tendon injury or it's a rotator cuff tear, but those are probably some of the two most common. Um, and then diving down in this, if we stay on the, if we stay on that, um, the elbow is a very common area for archer's elbow. I rehab that a lot. And then from a hunting perspective, I'll say probably the most common is the knees, the knees, the hip ankles and back. Right. And so, um, that is, I'd say the knees most common people coming out West, they haven't been training. They haven't been doing, you know, deceleration or descents down a hill. So anyways, I hope that explains that yeah. quite so a few. So let's talk about it. Archer's arrow, um, Archer's, uh, archer's elbow. elbow. Yeah. Right. Chav, ask him about it. Yeah. Archer's elbow. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Cause I know, uh, is it from locking your arm or, I mean, what causes that? It's a great question. And I don't know if, um, I don't know if, I have, I mean, I'm going to say we have some randomized control studies. I wish we did. That's my, that's one of my objectives is I want to do some actual studies and I do some, you know, observational studies and I do some stuff like that. Um, but an actual study would be awesome. It's just not there in the research because it's not that important for researchers to think about this. Unfortunately, we're a small group of people. Um, but I'll say from my experience in changing things, oftentimes it happens in the bow arm and i'll say that's primarily because either a lot of times it's from the i'm going to kind of show here as well it's from gripping that bow too much and so if they if they're if they're extended on that bow we all know that proper bow form you should really have that bow riser as little kind of thumb contact as possible bracing there your wrist extended and so once once people start really over gripping or changing up their grip, then they can get a lot of um, tension through there. And especially if they draw back and shoot and they're afraid of, you know, letting that bow drop. And so they're basically, you know, gripping every single time. I, I see that a lot. So a lot of my coaching, a lot of my training, I, I really work on, you know, lightening up that grip, really making sure that you got that good grip pressure. And then again going back to loading load up those tendons so that they're stronger so how do you do that that how do you load up those tendons to make them stronger yeah um great question the big the biggest thing yeah so bands i mean as a pt we love we love our exercise bands right and i and i do because i think they're they should be in every elk bros um box giveaway everything else Um, yeah there we go every it should be in every elk bros camp um But anyways, the, yeah, so the bands, I mean, if we're talking exercise, if if people are listening to this and they know about resistance training, um, negatives is the term we use in resistance training or the the technical term is called eccentrics. Um, what that is, is basically picking up a weight and then slowly lowering it down. And so picking up a weight with your wrist and then slowly lowering it down to really strengthen that kind of outside of your elbow there. But that's a really good one. Um, that one's going to get me out of business right there. Cause that's a good exercise. <laughs> hey, so I'm doing uh, it now, right now, doc. I mean, you know, we, I, I, I think I spend a, more time th- strengthening my elbow right now than I have anything else I Try to hold you know, it up and with the distal tear. Oh, I mean, then, we're eight weeks out of surgery, to, uh, nine weeks now. And I mean, I do a lot of, a lot of turning, you know, 
turning and stuff like that. The bicep really helps, you know, you turn and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So uh, we do a lot of that with three and I'm now up to five pound weight. So, I mean, you know, we're progressing as we go forward, but a lot of stretching exercises, a lot of uh, band work, a lot of, you know, put a towel under my arm and pulling on that towel, you know, or pulling on that yeah. band, stuff like one that. Of, yeah. One of the things that, I, you know, now that we're talking form, I think is a perfect segue because, you know, I, I like to, you know, look and do stuff and, and, you know, youtube channels and all this stuff and it's just a proper way of drawing the bow right so because i realized that the, the way i kind of learned it just when I, when I started shooting my my form when drawing is i do push forward but with the right arm i normally bring it down and then i find myself going back up after i i do that right and look i feel i can i can draw my 70 pound my 69 my 76 pound like that no problem i just i just push away i draw here but i bring it down to my chest level that's where i feel strongest and then i actually anchor but i've seen a lot of videos where they start with their elbow up and the bow up in front like this and and they kind of they open up that way and they just bring the elbow down and they immediately land in the anchor point right so for the life of me, I've tried that even with my lowest poundage bow and I cannot do it. I mean, it just doesn't come natural to me. It feels super awkward. I feel like super weird. And I was like, well, Looks weird. Some, something's wrong with me, because, you know, but you tried to do it at load, bro, because I'm, yeah. I'm, I was in the same place. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the problem is, is you've compensated, you've recruited, you've actually, you're at the high point of where I ended up at a low point doing the same thing, but it's all about once you go. Man, you threw me out for a loop on that on that logic over there, man. <laughs> well, Ooh, so in other words, low point of like in, whoa. In other words, I used to do this exact same thing until yeah. you start to wear that shoulder enough. You you uh-huh. then you keep compensating to where now you're lowering down and using more bicep and coming up, and now you're rotating into your shoulder on load from what i've actually learned from doc there so yeah. that's how you end up with a shoulder I, I'm, I can't wait to go look at your youtube well, video let's, yeah. let's ask i got it open right now i'm looking at it <laughs> doc, why don't you talk about what he was talking about why don't you answer his question absolutely i i'll tell you i see more injuries and now uh, again i'm gonna jump kind of back from a coaching standpoint and say if people draw that way um with we call it a low elbow right if people are drawing back with a low elbow versus a high elbow and they can, and there's no pain. Sometimes people come to me and they say, Hey, just, just teach me the right way to, to draw. Well, I'll, I'm going to say, yeah, I think the right way to draw, but you look at the professionals. If you look, if you look at the pros, kind of the research, the right way to draw is probably with high a high elbow and, and coming back into this position. Now, does that mean it's right for everyone? I'm not going to say yes, because if it works for you, great. So if that works for you and you're shooting and it doesn't even thought hurt, about it. it feels way more it, natural it, to me. See, I'm going to, I, and, and here's where I'm going to, I'm going to jump into this about as far as that under load, because I think it works for people for a certain amount of time until things to start to break down. Now, I don't know how long that is. There's, there's nothing, there's no, there's no research uh, substantiating this. I mean, I wish there were some randomized studies, but there's not. So how long to Joe take- about 120 years, <laughs> how, how long does it, how long does it take for that to, to break down? I don't know, but I will say people who tend to draw with a low shoulder are typically compensating because they are not strong in certain muscles. And a lot of those muscles, um, and I will say a lot of those muscles are those more key stabilizer muscles. Now I'll go into this and I'll kind of give an example as well. People that draw with a low shoulder typically are pretty fit. They're strong. They, you know, are in the gym, they're exercising and they have that bulk and that strength to be able to do it and get up into this position and, um, you know, and shoot. Now people who, who do that are not strong usually end up with an injury. Now what happens is you're under load you're drawing back, you're, you're under load here. And then as you start to rotate up, well, now your, your, your body, your rotator cuff is trying to stabilize 
a joint that should be stable under pressure. Now we're talking uh, maybe what six, 16 to 20 pounds, we'll say, yeah. depending on how much you're drawing, you got which can be, back, yeah. which is quite a bit actually for those yeah. small little rotator cuff muscles. So now you're rotating as I'm rotating up and getting into my anchor because every time you draw here, you have to get up to anchor, Absolutely. right? So every single time. So whether you draw high and get to anchor, it's maybe more efficient um, or you're here and then up. The problem with this one is you're under so much tension, 17 to 20 pounds, depending on your let off and everything. Well, what can happen is you can actually have little subluxation injuries where those muscles, you get micro tears and yeah. micro tears in those, in those small little rotator cuff muscles. And that can cause pain and it can cause a, a subluxation. So I was, I'm no lie. And I'm not just using this on um, my only data, but I drew back on a buck. You know, I was under, obviously under some buck fever, drew back way weird. And I felt my shoulder thinking, wow, what is going on? And I'm back in this position and feel my, my shoulder collapsed. The arrow sends off, miss a, you know, a nice buck and think, gosh, what did I just do? And what was I doing as I was drawing in an awkward position when I was hunting, not practicing some of those positions, right? And so I think no matter what, whether you draw with a high elbow, I recommend that. I prefer that if people are say, what's the correct way? I'm gonna say, draw with a high elbow, you know, push pull and really use those back muscles to kind of open up that, open up your chest and get into it. Yeah. Um, because it's more efficient and you have the stability already made in the bony structures as you're here. And you're not going to cause a shoulder injury that way. The other way, I've seen more shoulder injuries that way. Come from that. I and I may have to follow up with you on that because I, I have honestly tried and it just feels so awkward and I just can't. It, it, oh. I, I may need the proper steps. I, I was there. in the same boat because as soon as somebody mentioned about the shooting form, I tried going to it and the strength wasn't there. So in other mm -hmm. words, it, it's mm -hmm. like, it's like trying to sprint a 100 meter dash, you know, when you haven't trained for it, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can sure walk that 100, but yeah. now man. So when I did that, and again, when you come up here and you haven't strengthened those and you try to do that, you're actually setting yourself up for an injury. So the thing to do is, is to actually start light um get away from you know uh worrying about drawing at that at that point and and what doc did was i i think i was on four weeks of strengthening um before i even attempted to draw my bow uh on that and 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 i ended up going down with it just because for my for my confidence in my head right so uh and, and what's amazing is when i first started this what was interesting was I, I was reaching failure with the exercises. You know, they were only like three times 15. And when I was doing just a, a, just a, a draw Man, up here and, and with a bungee, you know, yeah. the first set of 15 I could get through. And then the next time, man, by five, I was fried right? Mm. And because those muscles had not been used in that way. And, you know, after about week four, when I'm starting to no longer be fried and I'm not have I'm not reaching failure and, and I go to draw my bow for the first time, the first time I did it, I was extremely tentative because in my mind, it remembered exactly what you were talking about, Luis, that it was awkward, right? But yeah. after I got through the first one, now what's interesting is now I'm drawing my bow and shooting and I'm not getting even close to the fatigue that I used to because the muscles are much stronger. more efficient. I, I imagine that's how Manano would feel once he starts thinking. <laughs> it, his, 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 his brain muscle, you know, whenever I, he starts using it, not even it will probably bend himself, man. You know, that's poor, <laughs> poor, poor, that's poor, poor Manano is just getting roasted. Oh, Sorry. he's getting oh, yeah. 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 He's he's used to show up, man. His he fault for not being sale. here. He's yeah. the Lincoln lawyer, man. Well, we, I don't know. We got to call him like the Mustang lawyer or something like that. He's always on a horse. But uh, Dr. Ward, I've, I've never even – I've watched myself draw on camera. I draw with a high elbow because I, I pull straight back, right? So I draw with a high elbow all the time. But I used I'm to. now – do what, Bob? I used to, and then yeah. after an injury, I compensated. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I've got a torn rotator cuff in my right arm. I have since – 
I was 21 years old. They tried to tried to fix it, but back in the day, 1987, 1988, they didn't have the technology that they have today. And and the guy was like, "Look, if you're not trying to throw 95 mile an hour fastballs, you ain't never going to have to have this worked on again." You know what I mean? So I don't, and but I do like bow hunting, and I don't have any problem in that shoulder pulling it back. But I'm wondering now with my injury that I've had for that distal tear is am I going to, you know, compensate or anything else for it? I mean, we've, the doctor and I, Dr. Uh, Eilers here said, man, I don't even want you picking a bow up to like August 1st. We'll talk about it then, you know, but I want to keep working on strengthening everything. And uh, while I feel very, I'm a, I'm a big fella, right. And I'm pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as strength goes. So pulling it back, I don't think it's going to be a problem, but strengthening that tendon back that's, you know, they had to drill that hole in my bone and put that button in there and get everything tacked back up. I, I'm sure it takes quite a bit of time to fully heal and strengthen the tendon. You know? That's the nice thing. So let me ask, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, let me, let me ask a follow-up on that really quick is how long were you immobilized? immobilized were, were you immobilized were you in a sling at all for any time or were you immobilized for any two time? weeks two, two weeks. weeks so interesting I, fact, did, I fished I, I did everything I you know it hurt like hell but I fished a tournament the whole nine yards mm -hmm. with it torn and he's like look yeah. generally I like to wait two weeks uh so some swelling will go down this that and the other but as quick as I can get on it I want to get on it and I, I was so I tore it on the second. I had surgery on the 22nd. So 20 days. Yeah. From. Yeah. And, and that's totally, yeah, that's, that's fine. I think the, the fascinating fact, which I'm just going to bring this up is because anytime you have, this was measured in the, in the quads, usually after like an ACL or something, but uh -huh. there was measurable, there was measurable atrophy noted at about three days of immobilization, mm. gotcha. visual atrophy in mm. at two days, three days measurable. At 14 days, two weeks, there was a loss of 25%. Of wow. 25% extension strength in the in the quads we're talking, right? So we kind of say, yeah, maybe let's extrapolate that over to the shoulder and other joints. But mm -hmm. at two plus weeks, you can have 25%. So now if someone's immobilized or let's say someone's injured and they're just kind of like, you know, they're not using it much. Well, think about that as far as, like how much atrophy happens, that loss of muscle strength, force production, everything. And so, I mean, yeah. and, and even kind of, even kind of use it this way, as far as if we're talking archery and hunting and preparing for it, let's say you're shooting your bow and you're shooting with this low elbow, whatever it is, and you want to go to that. Well, you're, you're not conditioned. You probably right. don't have the strength, yeah. right? So you need yeah. to really start with a resistance program. And that's why I'm, I'm harping right I'm harping right now on Instagram like hey we've got less than 12 weeks until we're hunting you know elk yeah, we've got start, less than 12 start weeks strength strength right now is is really where you should be yeah. strengthening and then yeah. if you need help that, that makes like, that makes so much sense Manano hasn't used his brain in 40 years imagine <laughs> the amount of atrophy I mean I just yeah, keep man. thinking about it man it's just like it just so you know the thing about the the resist and that's when when people hear about strength training like everybody it. always thinks about weights and pushing right and really strength bands um resistance Bungie bands cords, like like low it. weight awesome. You know, especially when you're dealing with shoulders, even like when you're trying to work on hip mobility, you know, I mean, it's just using body weight to do exercises that strengthen those uh, for an action. And and really, for everybody listening out there, I, I really urge you, especially guys who are going to be hunting, to take a look at things that you can do, like um, for your knees to strengthen, just straight leg resistance with weight on an ankle, where you're given tension in areas on your knees or on on your hips if you just look at simple uh, mobility exercises when you're on all fours and you can do uh, fire hydrants in other words look like a dog peeing on a hydrant right with that leg out and back in or you know where you're 
you're going knee to chest and then back to the you know kicking out those types of things that work the mobility of that hip think about the where you have your your areas that are going to be most crucial you think about your ankles think about your knees think about your hips it's generally the joints and so if you can work the mobility and the strength of those muscles around those areas you're going to be that much ahead now our shoulder we have to have because we shoot y'all and if we're you know if we are if we are not shooting as much because we're having pain in that or we're we're weak in those areas we're breaking down then there are things that you can do with resistance bands with light weight that can get you where you need to be and it really it it might only take a half hour i think my workout that you give me press in is about 30 35 minutes and mm -hmm. and here's the other thing is a lot of people think that they th when they think about weight training they think about monday wednesday friday you know they think about you know Tuesday, Thursdays, because when, when you're doing heavy lifting and stuff like that, when you're breaking down, you always have a day of rest in between. When you're doing resistance type stuff, you, you can pretty much do those exercises every day, Daily. maybe one day a week for rest, you know, or you change it to a different type of alternate exercise or go to something that is different from the exercise that you're doing that augments it so that you don't get caught in a rut. So th these are just kind of the things through coaching that Chav and I have done as well and along with what you've shown me, Preston, that I, I'm just trying to communicate with people that a lot of times when we think of training, we think of weights, right? And we think we got to go heavy, right? And when you're, when you're dealing with joints and when you're dealing with things like shoulders and stuff, you want to start light and your body will let you know if you're feeling yourself breaking down uh, on, on a certain rep you know if you're doing 15 reps and by five you're breaking down and you're feeling pain you're too heavy man i mean yeah. you need to lighten up and and you need to go lighter with that so that you, and maybe you need less reps until you build up to it i was using a band that I started out with that I had failure with that was an extremely light, easy band. I mean, now it's just so easy to me, and, uh, and but it's a progression. So yeah, they have different colors. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. And if you think of, I mean, absolutely, I will say with strength training, we think of weights and stuff like that, but whether it's bands, weights, whatever, um, there is a certain load typically you're looking anywhere between 60 to 80% of your one repetition max for strength training, for hypertrophy, for muscle gains, things like that. You want muscle breakdown. You want buildup of lactate. You want that circulation to get in there to, you know, flush that out. So you want all those things. And I'm thinking about that as I'm giving these exercises, but if you think of the smaller muscles, let's we're talking a lot of the rotator cuff muscles or maybe some of the postural rhomboids or the you know the muscles in the back the trap and things like that maybe 20 pounds is way over um i'm gonna say you're you know maybe that's maybe that's probably way over your one repetition max and so you can dial it down at the dis different colors of resistance bands and things like that or you can you know dial it down be and i think the important part to this though there is an appropriate load as far as um percentage of one repetition max or there is an appropriate there's an appropriate dose for everyone it changes up a little bit there's a there's a right amount of it needs to be this much it needs to be this many repetitions and that's why oftentimes i do prescribe exercise for some of these little muscles of it's going to be you know it's going to be a daily thing because we're trying to increase blood flow and odds are you don't necessarily need a rest day, maybe one day, like you said, because we're working some smaller muscles at a lower load, but, you know, getting that same amount of dosage in throughout the week. So. Awesome, man. Hey, yeah. hey Doc, ahead, where, where can people find you and get more info on this? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Mountain Physio, MTN p h y s i o so mountainphysio.com is the best way um i have a a portal on there that people can write questions they can email me they can do all sorts of things um, schedule appointments um, virtual visits i offer um you know some free virtual visits just to make sure people are getting the right therapy they're in the right hands and whether i can help them 
I have a team of um, professionals. I have a team of therapists that I work with, occupational therapists I'm hiring. So there you go. Um, but I have a team of physical therapists across the country as well. So my goal is to build up Mountain Physio and have it really across the country for everyone to I think it's um, so cool to get huh? therapy. So um, yeah, it's there. I, I, I have I have the team. So reach out to me at mountainphysio.com. Instagram, I'm on there most active, even more than Facebook. And so Instagram is mountain, M-T-N underscore physio. Okay. Um, so mountain physio there. And then, yeah, that's what I'd recommend. YouTube, yeah. sorry, I'm going to say YouTube as well. I, I just got a hit lot, you up. I, I just, of... sorry, ahead. I just hit you up on Instagram and I already stalked you up on the YouTube video. I've been watching the YouTube videos. You've been talking, just kind of looking at the draw and stuff like that. And looking at Beto's videos of drawing, he's talking about the high elbow and he's just all the way down here. Like, you know, you know, he, he's he crazy, thinks dude. he thinks he's like yeah, drawing like this and now he No, ain't, I don't have it up way high. I have it up. <laughs> so so i've been geeking like, out on i was like man i'm, like I'm this, all crooked bro. man i'm all crooked i know i look at my videos and i'm like <laughs> and this is that's i mean and i that's i mean so yeah reach out there and i want to just say that like there was a really interesting research article on proper form and it talks about the high elbow it talks about angles and i in my evaluations and stuff i'm always drawing angles on people, taking pictures, having, having them send videos of me, yeah. having them send videos to me of them shooting so I can make sure they're doing it correctly. Sure. But there is variation. I mean, we all probably shoot a little differently, whether your elbow is at 120 degrees or 117 degrees, there's sure. some variation and it probably doesn't matter if it does hurt. Archery shouldn't hurt. Archery yeah. shouldn't hurt. You should give me a call. Makes sense. Awesome. Mm -hmm unbelievable dr ward we can't yeah. thank you enough for showing up and getting on the podcast with us uh look forward to having you again uh guys if you like what we're doing please subscribe rate and review us you got to go to apple podcast or itunes to review us you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com and just a reminder if any of our listeners would like to have their questions answered on our show just send your questions to info at elkbros.com that's info at elkbros.com and like we say down here in the lone star state husbands kiss your wives wives kiss your husbands hug your babies keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry and we'll see you next week right here on blue collar elk hunting peace Woo. peace thanks peace. a lot preston we'll see you on the mountain peace, man thanks. What are we listening to? Oh, that's right, fellas. And, and uh, to close out our show, we got Brother Tony Wintrip with some awesome music. Oh, to help Thank you, Tony. What you smoking, boy? You don't smell like the stuff my grandpa used to do. When he carved them wooden ducks, he gently took a puff. A little bit of cherry was drifting in the wind I can tell that he wasn't all there, he didn't have much He just stared up into the sky and lit another match And he said, I'm just trying to ease the pain I ain't trying to rest no pain Let me be free every night I don't want to cuss or fight And I don't ever see the light At the end of this tunnel Is where I need to stay Oh, I'm trying to ease the pain He said, you got a minute, man I said, yes, sir Go ahead with what's on your mind He said I got a busted back And scars I got on both these legs from cutting timber Way up on a mountainside That old chainsaw was slipping right through the back cut Before I knew it I was upside down and on my butt I'm just trying to ease the pain I ain't trying to raise no pain Just let me be free Every night I don't want to cuss or fight And 
and I don't ever see the light. At the end of this tunnel is where I need to stay. Well, I'm trying to ease the pain. In a sleeping bag zip tight I wander deep inside what your story is And no one knows but you Would you open up if we had a few? Lord knows the cardboard sign don't say it all He said I'd give it all again if I could do it over And this old bottle of Jack won't get me sober Cause I'm just trying to ease the pain I ain't trying to raise no pain Let me be free Every night I don't want to cuss or fight I lost my kids and my wife At the end of this tunnel Is where I need to stay While I'm trying to ease the pain I'm trying to ease the pain I'm trying to ease the pain I just want to ease the pain